Seoul and Beijing celebrate 30 years of diplomatic relations. Foreign ministers of the two sides are taking part in related events separately in their respective countries. South Korea saw the number of newborns dip further last year. This comes when the average age of first birth spiked as well. Six months have passed since Russia invaded Ukraine. Thousands of troops are killed and millions are forced to flee. Hello, it's good to have you with us at this hour. I'm Daniel Che. Let's begin with our top story. President Yoon Song-il hopes to sit down with his Chinese counterpart soon. This comes as the two sides celebrate 30 years of diplomatic ties. At an event marking the anniversary, the South Korean leader voiced hope the two countries will move forward toward a more mature and healthy relationship by exploring new directions for cooperation based on mutual respect. China also commemorated the anniversary in Beijing, where President Xi Jinping stressed the two countries must remain good neighbors, friends and companions. Earlier on Wednesday, experts from both sides agreed during a virtual meeting to work on new cooperative models such as normalizing communication between the two leaders, as well as activating communication on stable supply chains. South's Unification Ministry held a meeting with Chinese Ambassador to South Korea on Wednesday. Kwon Yong se congratulated Xi Jinping on the 30th anniversary of bilateral diplomatic ties and said they should further refine the two countries' relations. Xi pointed out the anniversary marks a special day and that China is working hard to denuclearize the peninsula and protect peace and stability in the region. Kwon highlighted the constructive role China can play in persuading Pyongyang to respond positively to President Yoon Sung Yeol's audacious initiative. A South Korean general is taking charge of the Allies' latest joint military exercises. According to the USFK, Ahn Byung Sok, the deputy commander of the combined forces, switched duties with General Paul Lacamera. The drills have been led by a South Korean general before, but not for the whole duration. This is part of the Full Operational Capability, or FOC, assessment, a key part of testing Seoul's ability to assume wartime OPCON from Washington. The defense chiefs of the two sides agreed to the assessment last year. President Yoon Sung-yeol held a macroeconomic and financial policy meeting. During the session, the South Korean leader emphasized the government will thoroughly monitor and take measures to prevent any financial or foreign exchange crisis. Although external financial soundness improved significantly compared with past crises, Yoon called for vigilance because of increasing volatility in the financial and foreign exchange markets amid uncertainties over inflation and monetary tightening in major countries. The government and the ruling People Power Party reached an agreement on ways to draw up next year's budget. The Yoon administration seeks to cut government spending, something that hasn't been done for over a decade. Other key goals include boosting support for low-income households and the self-employed. Lee ji fills us in. Improving fiscal soundness while easing inflation. These are the two main goals the government and the ruling People Power Party had in mind when they met on Wednesday at the National Assembly to discuss next year's budget. In a press briefing, the ruling party's chief policymaker, Song Il-chung, said the 2023 budget will focus on helping those struggling financially by increasing energy vouchers for low-income households while running a debt adjustment program for small businesses and the self-employed. He added the two sides have also agreed to set aside a good portion of the budget to help young and disabled people seeking jobs. Eyes have been on how South Korea will cut next year's national budget for the first time in over a decade amid the tightening of global financial conditions. Earlier this month, Finance Minister Chu Kyung ho has said the government is looking to, quote, significantly trim spending in 2023 from this year's 679 trillion won or at the current rate of around 506 billion U.S. dollars. 
The finance ministry also aims to keep the government's budget deficit to GDP ratio at 3% or under, while keeping the debt to GDP ratio around the mid 50% level through 2027. As for other plans for the budget, the government and the ruling party agreed to also allocate funds for the design of a massive rainwater tunnel in Seoul following massive damage from torrential rain earlier this month. Lee ji Arirang News. South Korea has the lowest fertility rate in the developed world. Last year, even fewer babies were born here in the nation. As women are giving birth later than before, the average age of first birth rose as well. Lee helps us look beyond the concerning digits. Kids later, rather than sooner. At least that's what most young South Koreans have in mind these days. I think younger people tend to focus more on their own lives. Marriage and having children can lead to some restrictions. So I think that's why young people aren't having kids early. I think it's because of the um, high living cost in Korea. Because um, people, it costs a lot to raise a child, like, education-wise and just living and just food costs and everything. So people tend to marry later and kids later after they have, the, after they have their uh, career and those stuff in place and their housing and stuff. So I think that's why people have babies late. A report released by Statistics Korea on Wednesday shows that the median age of women giving birth in South Korea stood at 33.4 in 2021. That's 0.2 years older than the previous year and an all-time high since the relevant data was first compiled. The median age of the first birth was 32.6. The birth rate for women aged 25 to 29 fell by 3.1. For women 30 to 34, it fell by 2.9. But for women older than that, it was up 1.2. Statistics Korea says a major factor is the age of marriage. The average age of people getting married is increasing. That's why the birth rate after the age of 35 rose compared to the year before. The official also said the number of new marriages has been declining since 2012, along with the population of women of childbearing age. Last year's fertility rate, which is the average number of children born to a woman in her lifetime, fell to 0.81. That's the lowest since the figure was first compiled in 1970 and the lowest rate among 38 OECD countries. The number of babies born in 2021 dropped by over 4 percent on year to around 260,000. One expert suggests three factors that could raise South Korea's birth rate. Government and the society has to accept that more women are working, so uh, they have to uh, ha uh, have facilities which can look after their children. Uh, they also have to have a affordable uh, shelter, like an apartment. Also, the uh, household income should be enough to support the cost of raising a child and maintaining a uh, family as well as shelter. Uh, so uh, those factors need to be uh, in the uh, society and provided by the companies or the government. Meanwhile, the number of babies born this June dropped by a staggering 12.4 percent compared to a year earlier to just 18,300, the lowest figure for any month of June. Lee Hyun, Arirang News. During Chuseok, millions of Koreans travel across the country for family gatherings. The government is advising citizens to take caution and decided to extend ban on visits to nursing homes to protect seniors. Kim Jong-sil tells us more. The spread of COVID-19 seems to have stalled a bit since last weekend. But school has started and risks could increase during Chuseok. So we're by no means at the point where we should relax. We will focus more on protecting nursing hospitals and care homes. We will continue to ban in-person visits to these facilities to prevent infections among our senior citizens. Prime Minister Han said he's sorry people won't be able to visit their elderly relatives, but said that's for the best. The Prime Minister said there are 251 task forces assigned to take care of COVID patients at nursing homes, each team with one nurse and one doctor. He also encouraged children and teens to get vaccinated since they have relatively mild side effects. 
but he especially urged vaccines for people at high risk, like those with underlying health conditions. The government is also due to release the results of a survey of 10,000 people measuring the rate of antibody positivity in the population. The data will be used to figure out how many infections are going undetected. South Korea's new cases on Wednesday came to 139,339. That's down by around 41,000 compared to the same day last week. The government official said even though the number of cases has gone down overall, the number of severe cases rose to 573, the highest since late April. And ahead of Chuseok, when millions of people will travel across the country, the prime minister said the government is going to come up with disease prevention measures since this is the first Chuseok in the pandemic without social distancing. But he didn't specify what form those measures might take. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. Over in Ukraine, reportedly some 9,000 troops have died defending their homeland. Civilians have also been killed with millions forced to flee. President Zelensky vows to take back the country's territory, even Crimea. Shin Yeun has the full story. It's a war that killed over 12,000 innocent civilians and left some 11 million people with no choice but to leave their homes. And it's a war that is still ongoing. The Russian invasion in Ukraine dates back exactly six months ago when Russian President Vladimir Putin made a televised speech announcing for what he called a special military operation. The People's Republic of Donbass asked Russia for help. On this day, I have decided to conduct a special military operation that protects people who have been bullied and subjected to genocide by the Kyiv regime for eight years. Immediately, Russian forces moved towards the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, from all directions. That was their first mission, besieging Kyiv. But with not enough fuel or munitions, Russian troops failed to do so. Instead, their next target became Mariupol, Ukraine's port city linking the Donbas region with the Crimean Peninsula. This is how much territory is believed to now be controlled by Russian troops. The war is still ongoing and mostly focused on the eastern and southern pockets of Ukraine. The latest area of concern is the Russian-occupied Zaporizhia region, where Europe's biggest nuclear power station is at. Both Ukraine and Russia are accusing each other that they're preparing attacks on the plant. Recently, the UN Secretary General urged troops to stop all shelling near the plant, as it would be suicidal. After a Security Council meeting on Tuesday, the UN nuclear watchdog, the International Atomic Energy Agency, said it would visit Zaporizhia nuclear power plant within days once they're given access. But the war seems far from over, even with both sides losing thousands of soldiers. On Tuesday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky vowed to recapture the peninsula of Crimea, annexed by Russia eight years ago. We will take back Crimea. It is our territory. We will do this in any way which we decide. Russia, meanwhile, is expected to increase attacks. The U.S. State Department said it could launch retaliatory attacks following a car bombing near Moscow on Saturday which killed Daria Dugina, the daughter of an influential Russian nationalist with close ties to Putin. Moscow immediately blamed Ukraine for that attack, to which Kyiv completely denied. Shin Yun, Arirang News. The U.S. government says Ukraine is on course to ship nearly as much grain this month as it did before Russia's invasion. As a result, the global prices of food have started to dip. Lee Seung-jae zooms in on the developments. Ukraine is one of the world's largest exporters of wheat, corn, barley, and sunflower oil, providing 5 million metric tons of grain each month before the Russian invasion. The February 24th invasion led to a massive spike in food prices, especially in countries that rely heavily on Ukraine's exports. However, according to a senior U.S. State Department official speaking to AFP, Ukraine is on track to export as much as 4 million metric tons of agricultural products in August. The official added that more than 720,000 tons of grain have been moved from the Black Sea ports through 33 ships over the past several weeks. Assisting Ukraine with the logistics, an initiative called Solidarity Lanes established by the European Union has helped move the grain by river, rail and road routes. 
In fact, the initiative is helping ship roughly 3 million metric tons of grain into the European Union and beyond to international markets each month. The export of Ukrainian grain back to pre-war levels has helped bring down global food prices. The price of urea, a key raw material for fertilizers needed for farming, has also dropped significantly since mid-April, contributing to the fall in food prices. However, experts fear that the price decline could be temporary and that another spike in prices could be on the horizon due to the historic droughts seen throughout Europe. Still, the earlier-than-expected return of grain exports has been a pleasant surprise for many economists who say the worst outcomes, like a massive famine, have been avoided for now. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. The WTO released its latest global trade goods barometer. The figure remained steady over the past few months, largely due to China lifting many COVID-19 lockdowns. Kim Yo-sun brings the updates. The WTO says that its global trade goods barometer remains steady at 100, as the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine is being offset by the relaxation of COVID-19 restrictions in China. The barometer is a leading indicator that signals changes in world trade growth and is updated on a quarterly basis. Readings greater than 100 suggest trade growth, while a reading below 100 means stagnant trade. The latest data is consistent with the organization's most recent trade forecast in April, which predicted 3% growth in the volume of world merchandise trade in 2022. The Geneva-based international body explained Tuesday that global trade growth slowed to 3.2% in the first quarter, compared to 5.7% in the quarter before. It also slowed in the second quarter, but did post quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth. It stated that while the latest readings remain steady, stagnant growth would continue going forward. The report further added that indices for air freight and electronic components are pointing down, while the raw materials index has recently risen slightly above the baseline value of the index. It also noted that the container shipping index has risen significantly as Chinese ports have eased COVID-19 restrictions. Kim Hyo-sun, Arirang News. A K-drama telling the story of an autistic lawyer has been winning over fans around the world. This is partly because extraordinary attorney Wu shed light on some of the challenges and prejudices faced by people like the show's leading character. Many now wonder if enough is being done to help those with autism or other developmental disabilities. Kim bo -kyung turns the spotlight to this issue. 26-year-old Che Jun is an adult with developmental disability. Like any other person, he hopes to work, enjoy his hobby, and meet new people. But to get there, he needs help from a caretaker who accompanies him. Developmental disabilities make up around 10% of disabilities in South Korea. More than 250,000 people in the country have some type of developmental disability. One of those types of disability is autism spectrum disorder, which can be relatively mild in some cases like attorney Wu, but in other cases requires around-the-clock care. To help them, the Act and Guarantee of Rights of and Support for Persons with Developmental Disabilities in 2014 provided the foundation for support. And in 2018, the government came up with lifelong care plans to establish more daycare centers, hospitals, special education schools, and to offer more service vouchers. The budget to help those with developmental disabilities has increased from 6.3 million U.S. dollars in 2018 to 155 million in 2022. Yet, parents whose children have a developmental disability still say they cannot feel any improvement. When their children are of school age, parents at least had a place to send them to. But once they become adults, the responsibility again comes back to the parents, who are on their own having to look up scattered programs and centers they can send their adult children to. I have been trying my best for my child's education and treatment for around 30 years. 
Have they become better after being educated in school? No. And after they become adults, since then, it is just the mother's role to look for this and that program. But mothers also get old. Now it is getting tough for us to do that. Do you think I'd be able to die before my child? Of course not. For that to be possible, my child would need to be able to integrate into society in Gangdonggu district. That's what I'm most interested in. It's not about how many programs or services there are here and there. The country is putting the burden and responsibility on the parents' shoulders. Parents say this is because all the services and programs are tapped down and organization-centered. Politicians who themselves have children with developmental disabilities say it is important to listen to these parents' concerns. When we draw up a bill in budget, we need to design it with opinions of those with developmental disabilities and their families at the center. Their voices and needs should be the foundation stone. But bills and policies are still being made by the government and just delivered. It is a natural right for the disabled to ask for the country to feel responsibility. It is not giving benefits. The disabled, too, have the rights to live properly as humans according to the Constitution, and the country needs to do that. It is, in other words, the country's responsibility. Lawmaker Kang Sun woo along with more than 170 lawmakers, have proposed a resolution to come up with a special committee on the issue, but it is yet to be passed. Each scattered committee talking about one aspect of the issue does not solve the problem. Two or three ministries need to collaborate to even solve the smallest issue, and for that, creating a special committee is desperately needed. All understand the need for special committees on politics and law reform. My goal is to make people understand the importance of the country taking responsibility for those with developmental disabilities and the need for the committee. The first thing I did after becoming a lawmaker was to make a special committee for the disabled in 2004. It should not be temporary, though. The committee term is one year, so it could be tough, but should not be just mere formality. Clarifying the goal would be necessary if the special committee committee is launched. There is no doubt that extraordinary attorney Wu left a mark bringing attention to those with disabilities. But the gap between drama and the reality is worrying parents, as most of their kids are not like attorney Wu. To ease the burden on them and allow their children to have a fulfilling life, they need the country to provide more lifelong services and support. Kim bo Arirang News. Hello, I'm Lee Ji-yeon with the latest weather updates filling in for Lee Seung-min. The air, even in the afternoon, felt more like autumn today. The capital even had glimpses of sunshine under cloudy skies in the afternoon, but the southern parts of the country saw a mix of clouds and rain all day, with highs hovering in the low 20s, including in Daegu. But afternoon temperatures will jump right back to norms in the south tomorrow. And again, cloudy skies will dominate across Korea on Thursday except on Jeju Island, which will again be under mostly sunny skies with very high UV rays again. But some welcome news for those on Jeju, tropical nights on the island will finally come to an end tonight, and the rest of the country will continue to have good temperatures for sleep. Now, Seoul should be breezier tomorrow at a high of 26 degrees Celsius, Gwangju topping out at 29 degrees tomorrow. Now, we won't have much much to complain about weather-wise for the time being, while well, mornings and evenings will get breezier. With that, here's a look at the weather conditions around the globe.
These are the stories we're following at this hour from all of us here at Arirang News. Thank you for watching.